Hey, Pastor Eric Colser here. I hope that this sermon resource will bless you in addition to your participation in a local church. If you've been checking us out online and you're not a part of a church family, we'd love to meet you and get to know you in person. But again, we pray and hope that this blesses you and helps build you up to be sent out on Jesus' mission. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, this is our conclusion to this series, ReChurch. Uh, reminders from Jesus in Revelation. Uh, it's specifically seven letters to the seven churches. And uh, as he wrote to those churches at that time, uh, he also is writing to us. And uh, as we read this final and last church, the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, I want to remind you all that uh, every time God gave word to one of these churches or to us, there was four C's in there. There was a commendation, which is an encouragement, and things that they are doing good. Uh, there is a concern, warning of things that they're doing, the opposite of Scripture. Uh, there is a command out of that concern, what you need to do, and then counsel how to do it. Most often, as we know what counsel should point us to, it would be a reminder of the gospel. And so, uh, uh, no, in this specific church, the last church of the seven, what you're going to see here is that it does not have a commendation uh, for this church. Um, they have the three C's, the concern, the command, and the counsel. This is the only one that Jesus said, I have nothing really to commend you for, at least in this letter. And uh, although you think you are doing perfectly fine, uh, similar to the church that he said, uh, be awake, uh, dead inside, but uh, uh, outside, uh, you have the appearance of being alive, but you're dead inside, uh, awaken, repent. Uh, there are some similarities as you're going to see here. And so with the church of Laodicea, starting off with verse 14, Jesus' words to the church, not only here, but to us, says this, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. What sticks out in this introduction in comparison to the previous six churches is that this is the only introduction out of these seven churches that is not literally lifted from Jesus' first appearance to John in chapter 1, what we went through before we started this series. This is the only one that out of these characteristics or the attributes of Jesus that was specific to each one of the churches that was lifted this is the only one that wasn't mentioned there. Now, of course, this is all true of Jesus. The words of the amen, the one who says, um, I, I just finished, I will do it. The faithful and true witness, the one uh, who has been faithful to us, true witness. Those words were used in a couple of the other different churches. And of course, the beginning of God's creation, talking about Jesus, as we know from John 1, the Logos. This, who Jesus writes these words, and he starts off in verses 15 through 17 with this concern. And no encouragement, a concern. And what he says in verses 15 through 17 is that you are neither hot nor cold in your fruit and actions, but lukewarm. Read with me. Verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, know this before we get into those three descriptions, cold, hot, and lukewarm. Many commentaries, as of the last 50 or 60 years, point out how Laodicea, at this time when it was written, they piped in their water from a nearby city, and when they did that, it caused that water to be lukewarm, and Laodicea was known to have bad water, lukewarm water. I don't know if some of you guys remember uh, previously, and I say previously, it still happens. We have events, and often we don't have a cooler with ice. We just serve water that's lukewarm, and there's a running inside joke like, oh, we go to a church event, there's always warm water right there, okay? If you think that's bad and joke about it, it was a thing back then, okay? I mean, you could see quotes from like Socrates and others about like, oh, the lukewarm water, therefore like the poor, therefore the worst people, okay? So it was a little bit of a thing right there. You hear people like Paul Washer bring that up, and saying uh, that this is used as what they thought of lukewarm water at that time, which was 
useless. And again, as true as that is, I do think that there is more of an urgency of concern here than just in the cultural context that their water was lukewarm, it was looked upon as useless, they'd rather have cold or hot because of the descriptions at verse in the end of verse 17. Uh, it could be, of course, the parallels at that time with water, but also Jesus says, you say, I am rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, that seems to say that cold is not a good thing, which at the time, again, with the water, cold or hot, they'd prefer both of them were good, but lukewarm was just the one that was useless. And because of that, and because of the Greek word in verse 16, when saying, I'd rather have you either hot or cold, not lukewarm, and if lukewarm, I will spit, which will cover that Greek word for spit. Beyond that water comparison, I lean toward this being an illustration Jesus uses to the temperature of our hearts, how they are, how we are spiritually. And if that is the case, he gives, again, three different descriptions. Cold, hot, and lukewarm. If talking about cold being one who's wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, but not recognizing it, those who are cold or spiritually poor would probably be the one who does not care at all about Jesus his word, his church, his community, his mission, and would openly say and believe that it's all wrong. Probably someone who believes Jesus is either the liar or the lunatic instead of the Lord, a part of the, what God used for me to receive Christ in high school. That his word is nothing but a book of what you hear, manipulation by human authors who us, Supposed brainwashed Christians took to a whole other level and blindly ran with it. That would probably be a person who would think that church is nothing but an organized religion with some type of political agenda, judgmental, negative, dominated by those who want power, full fundamentalists who just, again, want to brainwash you. And of course, God's mission, they're offended by what we say when we share that we need to share the gospel with others. Sharing the gospel to people all across the world. How dare you tell someone that they are a sinner in danger of hell? How dare for us to tell other people that their religion is wrong? How dare for us to try to make something that should be private public? How dare for us to think that part of our purpose in life is to tell people that they need Jesus? This would probably be the atheist who wants to do nothing but maybe debate non-existence of God or the guy or girl who lives openly for nothing but their selfish, hedonistic pleasures. And they're not twisting certain things. They're not trying to justify certain parts. They are just open about not being a Christian and wanting to be a Christian. And if true, that is the temperature of coldness. What's crazy is that God says, Jesus says in this letter, in certain ways, I'd rather you to be one of these people been lukewarm. I mean, isn't that a little astounding? Pastor Joey was reading this beforehand and shared with me, I just find it crazy that Jesus says this. Like these people are being called out. This concern is here because they're just chilling. That's what he said. You know, they're not like doing these extreme horrible things. They're not on fire for Christ of what the, the scribes, but they're just chilling. Now, if that's cold for a moment, we see a description of hot, those who are spiritually rich. And I would assume those who are, and don't ever say hot for Jesus, that just sounds weird, but <laughs> spiritually. I did hear, as, as I say that, I did hear... Um, a testimony some of you guys had heard, Kat Von D, former tattoo reality show celebrity, uh, recently shared her testimony of coming to receive Christ, and she was on a podcast, an interview with uh, Allie Beth Stuckey, 
And she talked a lot about how she's on fire for Jesus. That's okay, okay? You can say you're on fire for Jesus, didn't say you're hot for Jesus, okay? But what would it look like to be on fire for Jesus, this spiritual temperature of hot? I would assume that would be someone who genuinely loves Jesus, loves the gospel, thankful for that, loves his word, and although not perfect, through their words and actions and thoughts and where their time is spent, it genuinely more times than others shows their love for Jesus. Helps prove it. They're not perfect, but in their imperfections, they are repenting and having a humble heart and life with that in repentance of their mistakes and sins. I would assume that they spend time in his word because they love to spend time with him. Looks for the gospel in it. Doesn't mean that, again, they're perfect maybe in this and that there's not seasons of dry kind of spouts or anything of the sort. But in the end, they know that every answer that needs to come from here and it's sufficient for everything we have in this life and everything we need to follow Jesus and live for him. And again, they're going to have, I feel like, a zeal, a passion for it. A love for it. Not just a checkbox, but if this is how my Heavenly Father speaks to me, I'm going to spend time in it to hear from Him. I would assume that this is one who, knowing that the church is not perfect, but how much Jesus loves the church, what He gave to the church, the power that's invested when united and centered on the gospel. And so they are involved and believe that it is truly community where we share our lives with each other, hold each other accountable, forgive each other, used in united growth. And not perfect, but what God uses when united to help accomplish his mission. And that would be, I'd say, the last thing. The one who, again, spiritually hot, per se, believes with all their heart in the mission of Jesus. Compassionate for others to know that God has entrusted us with the message of the gospel, that he died on the cross for our sins, that sin separates us from God, and out of his love for us, he took that penalty that we deserve on himself, rose from the grave, showing that he and only he has all authority and power over not only sin, but its ultimate consequence, death, spiritual and physical death, and Satan, the originator of sin. And he has conquered and defeated that through his death and resurrection, and that through us, out of God's grace, a gift we don't deserve and cannot earn, but given to us, when we hear that, believe that, we turn, repent of our sin, and have saving faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And they believe we are to share that with all others. People say, uh, oh, but that's private. No, that's public because people need that. And I say with boldness yet compassion that it is the power through the Holy Spirit to do it. And the church, when united in it, again, I would say, this would be some of the potential characteristics of those who are spiritually hot. And yet, as we go back to this, it says, I know your works, you're neither cold or hot, but instead, where I would rather you have either be cold or hot, which again, is a little crazy, but you're lukewarm, and I will spit you out of my mouth. There's this mushy middle. Those who Jesus describes as lukewarm, spiritually poor when they think they are rich, someone who gives the appearance of being in Jesus, but I don't believe agape sacrificially loves him. Again, maybe they say they love Jesus, but it's not shown through their mouth, actions, words, giving, doesn't think that there is anything wrong with this. They generally don't hate maybe sin, aren't truly sorry for it, and what God had to do to pay for it. 
Maybe instead they're just merely sorry because God is going to punish them and never really believe that this new life Jesus offers is better than maybe old sinful one. They just are trying to escape. Spent time in God's word can look like a checklist. Pretty much open at church or maybe if in community group or discipleship. Again, not really ever chewing on what God has to say to us and doing it more out of duty than love. And I'm, I'm sorry to say this. I know this can be a majority. And again, I know we go through seasons. But I also don't want to excuse how we, out of all people, are given more time than probably anybody else in this world to be able to spend in it and have more resources to be able to do it. Our idea of maybe community is believing that church is this place where you go to get your needs met and we do not care about others. And it seems like our actions or words are tearing others down rather than building others up. Care more about what people think of their actions than what God thinks of our hearts and lives. Someone who again claims to be a Christian because they have a Bible and go to church but they're not truly partaking in the body. And I would think that the person in this mushy, lukewarm middle would also be on their own mission within a church context, not the mission that we read about in Scripture or from Jesus. Maybe moved by stories about people who are on mission with Jesus, those who do these radical things for him, but they do not act out on the mission themselves. They assume that such action and works is for extreme Christians, not for the majority, and rarely share the gospel with neighbors, schoolmates, friends, because they don't want to be rejected, don't want to make people uncomfortable by talking about private issues like religion, and have prioritized, again, other missions over the mission of Jesus. And I think the hardest first part of this lukewarm people that is described here is that they do not realize how their hearts are in poverty. Look at and read verse 17 again. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. I don't need anything. I'm good. I'm good. I'm using the words of Jesus. I'm going to church. I'm good. Yet not realizing that you are wretch, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And again, as we read those final uncharitable attributes and characteristics of the heart you never would have thought that going through the motions, being apathetic, spiritually nominal, would produce or could produce such a state of heart. But it is dangerous. Greg Morse, a writer for Desiring God, said this, To put it plainly, I believe that men or women are far too comfortable in too many churches as they sleep themselves into hell. Nominalism, or if you want the Bible word, lukewarmness, is perilous to the soul and is too often ignored in churches. Outside of this reminder from Revelation 3, consider these other words from Jesus. Luke 13, 6-7, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look for three years now. I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? One chapter later, Luke 14, 34, Jesus said, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. And Jesus doesn't just say it there. He says there is a danger in our hearts and our souls of certain apathy. And we have to ask, I mean, to the extent of saying, I'd rather have cold? Really? I would rather have you be cold. Why? How? Todd, Pastor Todd Thomas, formerly of, of, of Centerpoint, you, him and I used to talk about this all the time when moving from Youngstown, Ohio, a more unchurched, but in some ways it seems like dark city. 
when moving to the south the same year for a Bible college, and it seemed like there was an evangelical church on every corner. And I don't want you to be offended by this. I've said it many times before over the last couple decades. But I know which one I'd personally rather do church ministry to. I know God has called me here. But it's much easier with the one who's not being fake. And you knew where they stood and they were open with where they stood. Because it was kind of crazy when first moving to the south and seeing and experiencing an evangelical church at every corner. And specifically as I'm a college student and ministering to many college students and tons of people saying, I'm a Christian and going to church, to mom and dad's church every Sunday, but in between getting drunk and sleeping with people and openly, not hiding it, not saying this is sin, I'm just struggling, but this, I can be a Christian, I can do this. And I, again, I'm going to tell you, there's one certain condition of the heart where it's a lot easier to minister to. And I can understand what Jesus would mean when saying, I'd rather have you hot or cold than in my name. And you just don't care. And you're using my name. And he says this, he says, I will vomit you out of my mouth in verse 16. I say vomit because if you study this in the commentaries, the actual Greek word, emeho, a different word that's used for spit otherwhere in the Greek language. But instead, this word, to vomit forth, to throw up, to reject with extreme disgust. That's what that word spit means here. It's not a simple nonchalant like, right? This isn't what, if you were part of my community group a few weeks ago, I know this is going to be disgusting, but bear with me. My wife, Jessica, called me out after everybody left. And she's like, Eric, you know, we all this crud, allergy, sinuses all going. And I'm helping lead the discussion in community group. But I got a tissue right next to me. And like in between their questions and talking, I'm like spitting into my tissue. And just like, a, I thought I was getting away with it. Obviously, I was not, as Jessica said, disgustingly pointing out, okay? And like gave me reminders of my grandpa with his handkerchief. Like, oh, you know, put it right back in, Okay. I was like, I'm, I'm becoming that. That's me. Okay. And then she even said, like, if your oldest daughter, high schooler, you know, teenagers, if she was here, she would disown you. Okay. I'm like, I don't think anybody in our community group knew or anything. She's like, they knew, Eric. They knew. And at the same time, I'm thinking two things. One, well, would you rather me just swallow my boogers? Okay. I know. Like I said, bear with me. That's kind of disgusting. And the other thing is, like, I'm trying to do that nonchalantly here. This is not the word Jesus uses. This isn't like putting it back pocket. This is violently vomit you out. A disgust of how you are saying and using my name. And yet at heart, that apathy, that not caring. God doesn't want the hypocrisy as described in verse 17, going through the motions, not looking any different, saying I'm spiritually rich, I've prospered, I don't need anything else, but really you're blind, wretched, pitiable, poor, naked. I will vomit you out. And I know that is jarring. And I've been asked different times in study of this specific passage by other Christians, does this mean they lose their salvation? I don't believe one can lose your salvation. I don't know if they were Christians, maybe not. I sort of believe they are, but Jesus, if anything, I believe, is showing his disgust with their apathy and uselessness. And he's using such extreme words and descriptions and illustration because he doesn't, he didn't die on the cross for you to live a nominal, useless, going through the motions life. He did it. And if anything, he's using such words and descriptions because he wants you to change. He doesn't want you to continue on that way. I'd rather have you say, I'm not a believer. And live that out so that you can recognize and admit and confess with your heart who you truly are. And your need for a savior by God's grace, hopefully. Or to be what I did free you, fill you to become. On fire for me. And for some in here, that may be 
receiving Jesus Christ for the very first time, although there may have been a false decision before. For others, and you do believe you really are, but honestly, you're just going through the motions. It is what we're going to get to in a moment, verse 19. For one way or another, he'd rather have us hot or cold. At least they live out what they say they believe. And I, before going to verse 19, here is the warning with cultural Christianity, even something that's heavily debated today, Christian nationalism. Here's the warning with all this. There are certain fruits from a culture that is created or accepted because of Christianity. And we should praise God for that. Of course, I want the ethics and the morals of Christianity prevalent in the city, measured in certain laws. How are we going to know what's right or wrong without God's word? And again, a teaching of Christianity. And I want that taught and seen toward my kids, our kids, instead of a worldly and sinful culture. Certain fruit from a culture that's created or accepted because of Christianity. But we are blind or liars if we don't admit that at times it can turn into a breeding ground for these type of lukewarm Christians as well. We must be careful of using Jesus and assuming everybody loves Jesus because they have the same values. I know which one Jesus says he'd rather have, and that's not saying we shouldn't fight and stand up for certain things culturally. We should but that is with a fair warning that there's many that start accepting the appearance of Christianity with certain hand-picked values and morals without the heart or mission of Jesus himself. And he says, here, I will spit that out. Again, I, I was reminded of this and bring this up just with warning as we can help prepare Shepherd and be on mission through this day and age. I was watching and listening to this vodcast by... Uh, somebody that was a cultural Christian, I'm sorry, a cultural conservative, this uh, uh, this lady that uh, had her 100th episode in celebration of vodcast, and so she had a whole bunch of other cultural conservatives on her vodcast. Uh, Some of them you probably don't recognize, no. Blaze TV personality, Alex Stein, somebody that's real popular on Twitter called the Redheaded Libertarian, uh, Gavin McInnes, which again, cultural conservative doesn't mean anything. That guy's the co-founder of the Proud Boys. Um, some of you guys may know or remember Ann Coulter um, and a couple other people. Again, this is a conservative podcast. And so in celebration of the 100th, 100th episode, they had all these people on here. But one particular person was a conservative porn star. It was a porn star that had conservative values, morals in certain ways, speaks up in certain politics of these things. And as she was on there, of course, her profession was brought up and debated. And through this debate, six of the seven or eight people on there said they were Christians. I mean, that kind of comes potentially with conservative values or morals and politics. Six out of the seven, eight said they were Christians. Yet out of the six... Only one could actually espouse a Christian worldview. The others either said in that profession, as long as it doesn't harm anybody, that's okay. Or they were just the most filthy and crude, attacking, and again, having other views. And one person, out of all people, the youngest one there, this like YouTube gamer girl, that gave a bold, yet loving calling out of what sin is and harm and danger, but then pointing them and sharing the gospel out of it. And I couldn't but help to think again how dangerous it is for us to use the name of Jesus and have in certain ways an appearance of Christianity with certain hand-picked values and morals without the heart or mission of Jesus. Verse 18 is a part of Jesus' counsel here, along with verses 20 through 22 with that, which we're going to get to in a moment, but first here, Jesus' command. Verse 19. 
Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. His command is for you to know his love, his love for you and discipline, because for you to recognize and know this is describing me, although I've been faking it or putting up the appearance. My apathy, this describes me, and I need discipline out of love. And then he commands for us to repent and be zealous for him. First, know that God, of course, still loves you out of hypocrisy, apathy, unrepentant sin in such ways. And he disciplines those he loves. It's part of the purpose of this scripture. You recognize that you're living in defiance of Jesus, making a mockery of his church and mission. You thought you were doing fine because people around you were doing the same thing. And yet you recognize it must change. And that hurts like all discipline hurts. When a parent lovingly disciplines a child, it's out of protection, guidance. That's what Jesus is doing when you recognize that you need this. And then there's, of course, zeal. Be passionate and zealous for the love that Jesus Christ poured out on us. Whenever this word zeal comes up in Scripture, I believe I always go back to how easily we show that same zeal and passion toward other things in life. It's not like it's... You don't have to be a, a created by God with this certain emotional tendency and certain passion and emotions to have zeal. No matter what your God-given temperament and personality, and you know it comes up in different ways for the things that you do love, that you're passionate about, that you can't but help to speak often about, spend your money on, that same zeal and whatever personality and temperament God has given you can and should go toward Jesus Christ. You can be passionate for the things you want to be passionate about, but God commands you to be passionate for his love and his glory. I, I can't but help every time I sing the second hymn or song that we sang today, when we get to that part that says, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. I can't but help to think about specifically his redeeming love, what he did in the cross for us, the example that he's given us. How I try to do my best, that to be my theme, specifically studying redemption. I want that to happen until the day I die. And then, of course, the word that's used at every other church and here, repent. Turn away from the things that either weigh you down or cause you to think that you're rich in Jesus when you're really spiritually poor. Turn away from certain apathies, certain heart conditions that you accept. I can just be in this mushy middle, not care, go through the motions. Repent of that to embrace a living, zealous love for Jesus that will overflow toward others and most importantly back to Jesus. And when saying that, I want you to watch our last testimony video. Someone who had shared after receiving Christ at a young age, but later recognized just checking off boxes, going through motions, and what God used and did for he to start zealously living for Jesus. Watch this video. So I came to know Jesus when I was, uh, was pretty young, I was six. And all through my younger years and, and up through high school, I did all the right things. Uh, my faith was, was purely based in my ability to check items off a list. It was reading my Bible, it was praying, it was going to church, but it was really nothing past that. Uh, and so when I got to college, uh, that whole life, uh, it just wasn't very fulfilling. I, I grew really apathetic in my faith. I don't think that I, 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 I do believe that I was a, a Christian uh, since I was the age of six, but I started thinking, what, what does this really have to offer? Because uh, it was really monotonous, it was really boring. It was just about checking boxes. My whole life uh, as a believer was based around making those around me happy uh, and, and trying to perform for them. 
And it wasn't until, until I got to college, my second, or, yeah, part way through my second semester, when I started uh, really looking into what does it look like to truly follow Jesus. I got involved in a campus ministry who challenged me to, to not just check boxes, but to truly know and, and love Jesus for who he was and have that uh, tangible relationship, even with a person that I can't see. And so I went on a, a summer, summer mission trip that summer to China, which is really hard. It was a hard place to be. Uh, ministry there wasn't easy, but there were people there that were lost and dying. And that's when Jesus really showed me uh, that what he says in, in Matthew 28, to, to go into all nations and to make disciples. That wasn't just a call for pastors or youth pastors or, or church workers, but it was for me, it was for everybody. And that's when I really started seeing like this passion grow inside of me to, to make Christ known where I was. So not only when I was in China, but when I came home and I got to serve uh, with my campus ministry, but also just share the gospel with my friends, with my classmates who were lost and dying. You know, Jesus changed my life, so how selfish should I, could I be to keep that to myself? And so God started stirring up the seal in me, uh, not to just check boxes and, and not to, to make other people happy or to look good or keep up appearances, but, but to truly live the way he wants me to, to share Christ with those. So I'd be reading the Bible so I, I can know him more, not just to check a box. I would pray to, to just speak with my Heavenly Father who loves me and cares for me not just check a box. And then sharing my faith became an outflow of that, which turned into a, a lifestyle evangelism in my job. Whether I was making donuts or, or now I get to do that full time is to, to share the love and the hope of Christ uh, with a lost, a lost campus at UK. And so it's really cool to see how I, I grew from this like really apathetic kid who didn't really care about my faith. It was just something I did and, and something that was expected of me to uh, now seeing myself as an adult, um, truly living for what Jesus calls me to, uh, and, and really being excited by that. It's not just about check boxes. Uh, and not to say that it doesn't get there, because sometimes, you know, life goes up and down, and, and my walk with Christ is just like everybody's, is, can go through seasons um, where we can be really close to the Lord, and sometimes a little bit farther away. We do grow apathetic, uh, but that zeal for Christ and to, to make Him known amongst a dying world around us is truly what this whole thing is about. When hearing his testimony, I'm thinking through those like lukewarm descriptions. <laughs> I know a lot of people in here is probably feeling this way. From the standpoint of just the lukewarmness of going through the motions of the checking off the, the boxes. And I know when you try to judge it or compare it to these ultimate horrific kind of sins, can you don't recognize what God thinks about it. But then when you realize that even this, the state of, of, of what the scripture says here, wretchedness, and even if that feels like a majority of us in here, as weird as this may sound or seem, we should praise God for that. And this is what I mean when I say that. If you feel like this describes you and your heart and condition, but you know you need forgiveness and want to change, well, I'll quote the great reformer Martin Luther, who had once said, May a merciful God preserve me from a Christian church in which everyone is a saint. I want to be and remain in the church in the little flock of the faint-hearted, the feeble, and the ailing who feel and recognize the wretchedness of their sins, the same word that's used here in Revelation 3, who sigh and cry to God incessantly for comfort and help, who believe in the forgiveness of sins. That's a great sign that you are ready for the counsel that Jesus gives here, and that we should all go to God for such comfort and help as Luther describes in Repent and Believe, he will forgive and embrace his love and zeal as you hear this counsel. As we conclude, listen, going back one verse before, verse 18, his counsel when Jesus sharing how I purchased the poor at heart so that you may be truly rich in Christ. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire 
so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and self to anoint your eyes so that you may see. His counsel for you is to receive that gold refined by fire, which is Jesus, and what he did on the cross for our sin and payment of that sin, and then the resurrection to give you that new life. That gold refined by fire is what he had to go through, taking the sins of the world, including the sins that are mentioned right here on that cross. And the new life it offers to make you rich in God's inheritance, inheriting a life in which you don't have to feel weighed down by that hypocrisy and that judgmentalism. That where you were poor, spiritually denying it, you've now become rich with purpose and fulfillment. That poverty and nakedness is now clothed with Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And you're able to see what God sees with that self to anoint your eyes. And now you're able to be passionate for the things that God is passionate for. And still, where this may sound so hard to embrace and change, skip verse 19 as that was before the command but going to more counsel, verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Verse 20, Jesus says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart, calling out your name. You repent, have faith in me. I will come and dine with you. We will become one where you will not go hungry anymore because of the temporary satisfactions you try to eat from the world or again the carelessness and apathy that has grown. But now you have the everlasting bread to eat from, be nourished from, grow from in this life. And this illustration here, the knock at the door, it's used many times with Jesus as he illustrates you to be included with his doings and his will. Again, that he will have the deepest of fellowship of sharing a meal with you and in you. And then, of course, with verse 21 and 22 in conclusion. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This final reminder, something that he's referenced at least to two other churches before. When you repent, have faith in Jesus You will conquer the sin that's blinding you, deceiving you. And instead now, you will sit down with his power, his rule, and with him on his throne. We have Jesus as king. He doesn't only conquer this sin, but all of sin in the fallen world. You have all of this. What a rich inheritance. So Jesus says, I bought your poor, lukewarm, or maybe cold heart in the gospel. I want to make you spiritually rich and everything I have to offer, eternity, hope, a father who will always be there providing for you, pouring out more grace on you. And I'm standing at the door, that poor, cold, sinful heart, knocking. And if you would just open up, you can have what I can. True, abundant, eternal life. A zeal as you're reminded what I've done for you, how I sustain you, that will extend not only to him, but others. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this series and this final word to the church. Lord, where we don't see a specific a specific commendation or encouragement to this church, we know with this concluding counsel, it is here. That only through the gospel of Jesus, your son, who was refined by that fire in order to make us rich, to give us righteousness in place of our unrighteousness, and by opening up our eyes, that even in our nominalism or our apathy, our carelessness, or sin of just going through the motions and not caring for you or others and putting our passion and love and zeal in other places before you. That you make so abundantly clear 
we need you and you're here knocking on the door that we can receive you. And God, I don't know if that's anybody in here that needs to do that for the very first time. Even though they may have made a decision or this is new, they were what was described as cold before. But God, you're knocking at the door and they're recognizing I need you. I pray that they do that. Even as we sing this song or at their seat or later on or even pulling a pastor or a leader aside, Lord. And God, for those who are in here, that describes many of us and definitely me in times and seasons. And you want to use this as that reminder that we should not be living lukewarm lives with such urgency that you say, I will spit you out. That again, you're knocking at the door for us to embrace a zeal for you. I pray, Lord, that as we sing this, we're reminded of the truths of the gospel. And we desire to live that out and share that with others. That we love your church and your mission and your word more than anything. And we'll go through ups and downs, but that you'll continue to give us these reminders and sustain us. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for your word. And let us sing with our heart, at least, in the same type of zeal. In your name, Jesus. Amen.